We're on the verge of war. The second of two catastrophic wars that completely alter the world. Now, the United States does well uh, as a result of these two wars. But from a humanitarian point of view, these wars are just horrible for the, the world, especially for Europe. Now, South Africa and India and China will do well in the fact that they will, the Europeans will be so weakened that they're going to lose a lot of their power. But that will bring friction in all of those states in this post-colonial situation. But of course, it's the rise of Adolf Hitler and the fascist and the ones who want to change the situation after World War One. I'm a diplomatic historian, and what we're about to talk about here is that what shapes our involvement in the world. Here we are in the Western Hemisphere. But there's going to be three things that get us involved usually in world affairs. Our interests. What, what interests do we have that lead us into foreign affairs? Money. Money? So let's call that economic interest. What's, the ne- what's another thing that would cause us to get involved abroad? Oil. Militarily. What would be another concern that we might have? Safety? Thank you. So I'm going to call that security. And these are the fundamental two reasons why America gets involved in the world. If we feel that our economic uh, imperatives are threatened, it could be trade with other countries. Uh, Someone might be taking trade away from us. It could be foreign markets. Do we have any problems on the horizon that are going to lead us to think that our economic situation is threatened by what's going on in Europe? Now and then, by the way, what we're about to talk about right now becomes the big training ground for all of our current diplomats. And as we look at what's going on in the Crimea today with the Russians and the Russian resurgence, they're all thinking back to the 1930s. And how did we react when Adolf Hitler or Mussolini or the Japanese were on the rise? And so I want you guys to know it as well, right? To be informed about what's happening. We're going to be threatened by Japanese aggression in China. Are we threatened by the Nazis in Europe in the 1930s, do we feel real threatened in the... We're not convinced that they're a threat. By the way, if we feel threats, threats are going to lead to... Threats lead to action. Americans in the 1930s, America first, do they want to get involved abroad? They don't. They don't want to get involved abroad. Because when we go abroad, what does it cost us? It costs us lots of money and... What? Lives. What shall I use for that? Markers? What are all over Normandy Beach? Thousands and thousands of either crosses or Star of Davids, for the most part, and a few crescents. There are lots of lives and money. And Americans don't want to do that. Naturally, we care about keeping our money for ourselves and not spending hundreds of billions of dollars. And we don't want to spend millions of lives getting involved involved overseas. We're going to see the Nazi threat grow dramatically and we're going to wonder what to do with them. At first we're thinking, can the Nazis take care of some things in Europe and not be a threat to us? We're going to begin to see that shift. There's one more element where we sometimes get involved in international affairs, but it is rare. What might be another reason that we might send in troops somewhere to do something? Thank you, that's the last word I was looking for, humanitarian, or some kind of good outcome. This one's the wild card in the group. We like to, before we project power abroad, say that all three have been checked off, and that we are doing, we're keeping up with our our world historic role to play in the world. That is, that we're supposed to be a force for good. But what happens when we don't intervene in a place? Could we involve ourselves on a humanitarian basis to stop? What do we usually want to stop? by sending in forces. What might one want to stop? Would we want to stop genocide? What if people are killing lots of civilians? What if there's an evil regime that's killing their civilians? Are there places in the world where civilians are being killed by regimes? Can you give me an example? What's a horrible regime that is allowed to continue on but we don't want to mess with them because they're it's problematic? Right, we don't intervene with North Korea. They've got hundreds of thousands of people in these prison camps, forced labor, execution of people, a police state. Why don't we mess with North Korea? They've got military weapons, a lot of them. Why didn't we mess with Rwanda? 
Why don't we go into Rwanda in 1994 when the Hutus were killing all the Tutsis to the number of about 500,000? Which one of these were on the board for us? Anything? It would have been purely humanitarian, wouldn't it? And we, we don't do it. So we don't always do things for humanitarian. In fact, we rarely do things for purely humanitarian. It's usually these two. Sometimes we say we're doing something for humanitarian when it's really these two that are motivating us because we might be seen as being aggressive. At any rate, I'm giving that as a background for what's going to happen in the rest of the 20th century. Let's now look at the series of events that lead to World War II and the diplomatic crisis that we are faced with. And the diplomatic crisis we're faced with is Adolf Hitler's efforts to overthrow the Versailles Treaty. At the end of World War I, the Versailles Treaty stripped from Germany Alsace and Lorraine, which they had taken in 1870 back from the French. They also lost a big section here to Czechoslovakia. It's a mountainous region called the Sudetenland. Lots of Germans all of a sudden found themselves inside Czechoslovakian borders. The reason they gave them that mountainous area was so that Czechoslovakia would have a, a natural border between themselves and Germany. And then Poland was recreated on the map at Versailles. Lots of Germans living in this area because the Germans had taken over that area back in the 1700s. Now, some other changes in the map that you need to be aware of are the Baltic states. Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania had been under Russian control since the 1700s. So the Russia lost those territories. Germany lost in here. Austria had been a large empire, y'all might remember, and it got broken up to where it's just little Austria where the German-speaking people are. Now the problem is that the Germans promised not to change the borders by military action. They promised in 1928, even 10 years after the Versailles Treaty, that they would not do it militarily. However, by 1932, we have Adolf Hitler and his Nazi party is dead set about reversing the situation and bringing Germans wherever they are in Europe into Germany. Now the way Adolf Hitler gets this going, this is a postcard from the period, this little gray area is where there are lots of Germans. Uh, this is uh, Goebbels, Hitler's pr chief propagandist. And what they begin to say is the Germans living in Czechoslovakia in this region are being subjected to, well the elderly are being mugged and mistreated by Czech thugs. Young German women are being molested and raped and forced into bad situations by these Czech thugs. And remember the Nazis have this idea that A, Germans are the top humans of the world and then the, the orders go from there. The Slavic people who live to the east are Undermenschen and here these German people are being subjected to a bad situation. So he feels that he should go in and protect them. Protecting others is a nice reason to go into something, right? I hate to juxtapose too much, but I'm, I'm too tempted by it. The Russians are now saying there are lots of Russians in the Crimea. Therefore, they need to go and take the Crimea. It's also strategically very important to them, too. At any rate, what this leads to is your ID, the Munich Conference. Munich is in Germany. And in March 1938, this is also uh, has ramifications for today, Austria. How many of you guys have seen the movie Sound of Music? When they get back from their wedding honeymoon, there's a big Nazi flag hanging over the front of the chateau. The Nazis have taken over Austria. Well, the German Nazi party has taken control of the government and they ask for Germany to annex them. And Germany says, of course, we'll annex you. And they roll troops in. And that's what sparks that Jewish refugee crisis because all the Jews who've been living in Austria are now fleeing. France says to Germany, that's a violation of the Versailles Treaty. You guys promised not to do such things. And so the French you know, yell and scream, but they're not willing to act. They're going to stay behind this, this defensive line they have. And so for Hitler, he realizes the West, if they don't challenge him when he takes Austria, they're not going to challenge him next time. He knows they don't want to fight. And that's the big lesson that we're dealing with right now. What if you don't confront aggression? Summer of 1938... Adolf Hitler and Goebbels start this campaign saying that Germans are being mistreated. He moves troops to the border, just like troops are being moved to the border of Ukraine right now. This sparks the Munich conference because the French are in a defensive pact with Czechoslovakia. They had said that if either one of us gets attacked by Germany, we'll go to the aid of the other. The French were thinking that they'd be attacked and they wanted the Czechs to come in on the other side. They always, the French always want to have somebody else helping them fight Germany. They used to use 
the Russians to help them fight against Germany, right, in World War I, but they had lost that because they had become the USSR, and they were not friendly anymore with France. So, the Munich Conference, here's some photographs from it, is when Neville Chamberlain from Great Britain, he's a prime minister, flies to Munich to meet with Adolf Hitler, trying to convince him not to invade Czechoslovakia, because if he invades Czechoslovakia, that will trigger some mechanisms whereby which the French have to go to the defense of Czechoslovakia, and that might bring Britain in. So the French foreign minister comes. Adolf Hitler has his big map here he's going to work with, and he's got his buddy Mussolini from Italy there. I'd like you guys to know that the Czech president is there. He's invited too, but he's kept downstairs in the parlor while these other men go and figure out the fate of Czechoslovakia. Hitler goes on for about an hour ranting and raving about the mistreatment of Germans in Czechoslovakia. And they finally say, listen, if you go in and take the Sudetenland, if we can get the Czechs to stand down while you come in, will you promise that, that you'll be satisfied and that you will leave the rest of Czechoslovakia alone? He said, I promise. Where do I sign? And so they get him to agree to, to take this territory. They go downstairs, they bring the president from Czechoslovakia, and they say, congratulations, your country is not about to be invaded by the Germans. What you're going to do is remove your troops from the Sudetenland and uh, that will be annexed by Germany. And the Czech president says, you guys are fools if you don't stand up to this aggression. And Neville Chamberlain goes home. He lands at Heathrow Airport, waves a piece of paper with Adolf Hitler's signature on it. And this is the famous quote from him. The famous quote that comes out of the Munich conference is, I've done it. I've secured peace in our time. He thinks he's avoided this war by getting Adolf Hitler to sign off saying that he's not going to seek any more territory. That's October 1938. In the spring of 1939, Adolf Hitler takes over the rest of Czechoslovakia. Do the English now look pretty stupid and the French look pretty stupid? Now he begins to hone in on Poland. But before we talk too much about Poland,